the moment uh, we are born as human beings, life has become very complicated. If, if you had come here like any other creature on this planet, stomach full, life settled. Once you come here as a human being, stomach empty, only one problem. Stomach full, one hundred problems. Because <laughs> what you call as human is not going to be settled by fulfilling your survival needs. If you had come like any other creature, survival would fulfill your life. Eating, sleeping, reproducing, dying one day would be a complete process. Once you come as a human being, all these things you have to do, but only when survival is in question, it means something to you. Once it is there, it means nothing to you. Because what is human kicks in only after your survival is taken care of. So, what is this whole thing? In the evolutionary process, we are supposed to be on the top of the pile on this planet. If you look at this topmost creature on this planet, also the most miserable creature on the planet. Every other creature, if their survival requirements are taken care of, they're just quite okay. Maybe they're not ecstatic, but at least peaceful. But today you see, human beings, even the so-called spiritual leaders unfortunately, are saying peace is the highest goal in your life. Just now somebody asked me, how to attain ultimate peace? Spiritual leaders are going about teaching, peace of mind is your goal. Such people will only rest in peace. It'll only happen when they're dead. Till then it won't happen. Peace is not an ultimate goal of your life. If you want to enjoy your lunch today, you must at least be peaceful, isn't it? Hello? Are we in talking terms? Are we in talking terms or is this a problem? Is it true if you want to enjoy your lunch, if not joyful, at least you must be peaceful? If you want to enjoy the people in your home, if you want to enjoy the people at work, if you want to enjoy the process of work, at least you must be peaceful, isn't it? So is this the ultimate goal of your life or is this the most basic requirement in your life? Hmm? It is the most basic requirement. Now this basic requirement has become impossible for a whole lot of people because uh, most people are in a constant state of mental diarrhea. Yes. <laughs> they think it's intellectual. There's nothing intellectual about it. You lost control over the faculties of your mind. Yes or no? Is there something intellectual about always buzzing with thoughts? No. You just lost control over the fundament fundamental faculties of your mind and you think it's intellectual because there are a whole lot of people around you in the same condition. Now, whether it's your body or your mind, if I want to use this hand, it moves, otherwise it sits down here. This is a useful hand. Suppose my hand is jumping around all the time, would look ridiculous or no? You must talk to me. Those of you in the darkness, I don't know, they've set the right kind of lighting for you, I am being blasted. That's good. <laughs> They've set the right kind of lighting for you to doze off. I don't even know what they say. Oh, that's nice. Somebody's very responsive out there. <laughs> now, would this, would this not be ridiculous if your body started doing its own things without your permission? Yes, 
Is it not equally ridiculous that your mind is doing things without your permission? Your only comfort is others cannot see you, but now you're lit up. Sitting in the darkness of your mind, you think others cannot see it. No, if they pay enough attention, they can see it. Yes? So, if we want to live a sensible life, forget about a spiritual life, so per forget about some phenomenal life. If we want to live a sensible life, at least being peaceful and joyful is a basic requirement, isn't it? To just live sensibly, I'm saying not to live some phenomenal life. But that is not happening to over ninety percent of the humanity because we have taken wrong steps and we think we can fix it by fixing the whole world. Today, whatever we are doing, there are many ways to look at this, but one aspect of everything that you are doing is in pursuit of your happiness, isn't it so? See, first we must decide here, who is the yogi, all right. If you think you can just stare at me like this, I have a very long practice. I can sit like this for the next two hours without batting an eyelid. Hello? We're talking, all right. Is it true that if your body and your mind took instructions from you, naturally you would create utmost pleasantness for yourself. Yes or no? If unpleasantness is happening, obviously your body and your mind not taking instructions from you. This out of control state, you are giving it all kinds of names. If you are given a choice for yourself, pleasantness would be the choice, highest level of pleasantness, isn't it? What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, but what you want for yourself is clear, isn't it? Pleasantness means what? If you're pleasant in your body, we call this health. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. If you're pleasant in your mind, we call this peace. If you become very pleasant, we call it joy. If you become pleasant in your emotion, we call this love. If you become very pleasant, we call it compassion. If you become pleasant in your very life energies, we call this blissfulness. If you become very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call this success. This is all you're looking for in your life, isn't it so? You want your insides pleasant, you want your outsides pleasant. Organizing outside pleasantness needs a certain amount of skill, certain amount of cooperation from many people around you. There are many forces in the outside situation. You must have the skill to get the cooperation of… If you can keep the cameras down, please, uh, those of you who are on… You want to look at me through your third eye, you can do it, but not an apple eye, okay. To create external pleasantness, it's a certain level of skill. People may not cooperate, situations may not cooperate, many forces in the nature may not cooperate sometimes. But to create inner pleasantness, there is only one ingredient, you. Only one inside of you, I'm asking you. Only one, nobody else. Now because there is a whole lot of spiritual jargon happening, uh, my ahankara, my atma, my paramatma, everything inside. See, if there are more than one person inside this body of yours, either you are schizophrenic or you are possessed. You either need a psychiatrist or an exorcist. So I hope it's not the case. Just you, right? Just you means easy. If you are willing, Nobody can mess with this, yes or no? You want to create pleasantness in your home, your family must cooperate. They never cooperate hundred percent, yes or no? They cooperate, but never hundred percent. Have you found 
one person in your life, your husband, your wife, your parents, your children, your friends, your partners, anybody, have you found one person in your life who is one hundred percent the way you want them? No, not even your dog. Because these days they do their own thing, you know. Not one person in the world happens hundred percent the way you want them, but that is not the problem. Is there a problem with the audio? Hello? Is the audio not clear to you? Then what? It's okay, sir. So nobody has happened hundred percent the way you want them. It doesn't matter. Nobody ever happens hundred percent the way you want them. Even if they're just two people in the family, it never happens hundred percent your way. You should not expect that. If it's happening fifty-one percent your way, you have the controlling stake. Just shoot for fifty-one percent. If you shoot for hundred percent, nobody will live with you. Yes or no? If hundred percent your way, nobody is going to live with you. Fifty-one percent your way is a good ambition. If you achieve that, you're doing great. But within you, only one ingredient, just you, this person must happen your way, isn't it? Yes or no? This one person must happen your way. If this person does not happen your way, you're a lost case. Why is it this person is not happening your way? Willing? Is he willing, I'm asking? Willing? But not happening your way, why? One thing is, approach is fundamentally wrong. On a certain day, Shankar and Pillai was going home. 7.30 in the evening, there are rules at home. You know, every home has some rules, otherwise they can't be a home. Some rules, right, may not be written down, but there are rules. In his home, the wife's rules are, eight o'clock he must be home. He saw still there is time, he, he doesn't want to go even a minute early. So he thought there is still time. So he walked into a local bar thinking he'll just have a quick drink and then go home. Well, he had a quick drink and a quick drink and a quick drink and a quick drink and a quick drink. Then he looked at his watch. It says 2 a.m. You know, drinking people are like yogis, they're timeless. I see there's a lot of appreciation <laughs> So, he got off his tall stool of the bar stool. It's an unfair world, it's a completely unfair world. You expect a man to walk on a round planet and the damn thing is spinning, you're supposed to walk on that. Only when you have a few drops extra or a couple of drops missing between your two ears, suddenly you realize the planet is round. With great difficulty he was trying to find his way back home. He took a shortcut through a garden and unfortunately he fell headlong into a rose bush. His face became a mess. He gathered himself, somehow went home and those damn keyholes, they made so small, you know. It took another twenty minutes to find it. Somehow he went in, crawled up, went into the bathroom, looked at himself in the mirror, complete mess. So he opened the medicine cabinet, took out some medicine, plaster, band-aid, everything. He fixed himself, then slowly crawled into the bed. Fortunately, the wife, He's a big sleeper, so she crawled in and fell asleep. Morning eight o'clock, the wife took a bucket of cold water 
and threw it on his face. What about it? He woke up. Why, why? It's only Sunday. She said, you fool, again drinking? He said, honey, six months ago I promised, since then I have not touched a drop. These are domestic conversations, okay? I'm just exposing. I have not touched a drop. She grabbed him by the shirt and took him into the bathroom and showed him. All the plaster was on the mirror. Now, this is the whole problem. You feel unpleasant, you think this one has to be fixed. You feel unpleasant, you need to think that one has to be fixed. You feel unpleasant, you have to be… you think the whole world has to be fixed. Now, I'm asking you a simple question. If you are feeling any level of unpleasantness, stress, anxiety, anger, fear, whatever nonsense, rubbish, whatever is happening within you, who should be fixed? If something is unpleasant here, who should be fixed? Oh, if you understand this much, this is transformation, you know. This is fantastic in ten minutes, this is great transformation. If you… <laughs> if you understand this much, this needs to be fixed, not something else, the world will change. Right now, everything that we are doing on this planet is in pursuit of human well-being. In the last hundred, hundred and fifty years, with the aid of modern science and technology, we have done too much external engineering, too much, which has rendered us into a certain level of comfort and convenience. We have comforts and convenience no other generation could even imagine, isn't it? Yes or no? The level of comfort and convenience in which you and me right now existing here, no other generation could ever even imagine. We are the most comfortable generation ever. Do you agree with me? Physically. But can we claim we are the most peaceful generation or joyful generation or loving generation or ecstatic generation? No. In many ways we are becoming the most neurotic generation. We are complaining about any… everything and anything like never before. Yes? We are complaining about everything like never before in the world, though we are the most comfortable. Definitely, materially you're living better than your father and your grandfather, aren't you? Yes or no? Unless your grandfather happened to be the Maharaja, unless that, otherwise all of you are. In fact, what royalty could not afford a hundred years ago, Today an average citizen has, isn't it so? All of you are driving chariots with hundred, two hundred horses. You are. So, it's not that there's something wrong with life. It is just that fundamental faculties of life are not taken charge of. This is an evolutionary problem in a certain way. See. Between you and a chimpanzee, the DNA difference is only 1.23 percent. Hmm? 1.23 percent is not much of a difference, isn't it? Physiologically, the difference between you and a chimpanzee is only 1.23 percent in the DNA content. But in terms of intelligence and awareness, we are phenomenally different from a chimpanzee. So you have an intelligence for which you don't have a stable enough base. It is your intelligence which is torturing you right now. If we take off a part of your brain, I think most of you will be quite peaceful. Really. Yes or no? This is why a whole lot of people are saying, I want to be like a child, even spiritual leaders going and saying, I am a child. See, suppose you are stuck 
Let's say your body or your mind stayed at the age of six. You are a child. Is it a great state to be, I'm asking? You may think you're spiritual, I will call you retarded. Yes or no? You want to be a six-year-old child, I'm asking you. Because almost every adult is saying, child, being a child is beautiful. Because they've forgotten what it means to be a child. Child means when somebody says, wake up, you have to wake up. Somebody says, go to sleep, you have to go to sleep, go to school, go to school, get back, get back, eat. Eat all the damn things that you don't like. When you were a child, you desperately wanted to grow up as quickly as possible, isn't it? Now you want to become a child because you messed up your adulthood. Whoever messes up this wants to be somewhere else. A whole lot of people say, no, no, I'm not interested in all this, I want to go to heaven. Why? Because the advertisements always said, heaven is a very pleasant place. If we had told you from your childhood, God lives in heaven, but it's a horrendous place. Do you want to go there? Please tell me sincerely. No, no, we'll pray from here only. We don't want to go there. Because they've advertised that it's a very pleasant place, lot of people who made a hell out of themselves here want to go somewhere else. Those who want to go to heaven must go, isn't it? They won't go, that's the problem. If those who want to go to heaven go, those who want to be here can create a heaven here. Now, those who have made a hell out of themselves, they don't go. They keep on talking about going, but they don't go. If you're so sure you are going to a better place, you must leave today. You should not postpone your appointment with God. I'm asking you, if you have an appointment, forget about God, if you have an appointment with the local minister or prime minister, somebody, you would like to jump the queue and get there quickly, isn't it? Even a cinema ticket, if you're standing in the queue, you would like to jump and get there quickly, isn't it so? So if you have an appointment with God and you're so sure, why are you postponing it? You must go today. <laughs> okay, I'm saying, your mind is full of all kinds of rubbish picked up from here and there. Just now we were talking just outside, but somebody said something five thousand years ago, somebody said something three thousand years ago. With all you, with greatest respect to all of them, do you believe that thousand years ago people were way smarter than what you and me are today? Do you believe so? Huh? I'm asking you. If you believe so, it's unfortunate because life seems to be evolving. But some people are not. Some people seem to be those who want to be child, children now, after they've grown up, they're retarding consciously. <laughs> they're trying to somehow wrap themselves in a situation where they will not grow. So essentially, it's your own intelligence turning against you. If you had come like an earthworm or a grasshopper or a bird or a tree, you would be quite fine. Because you have entrusted with such a huge intelligence, this has become your problem, isn't it? You know, last year, in the month of August, we were trekking in Tibet. I'm in a tent. So, another person is cutting an apple and there's one more person. You know one of those uh, new porcelain knives which are supposed to be very sharp? So this person is cutting an apple and the other person says, it's a very sharp knife, be careful. It irritates me. A knife is supposed to be sharp, otherwise why will I call it a knife? Something is blunt, I don't call it a knife. It's supposed to be sharp. And this is… if it's a child, yes, I would also say or I would go and take away the knife, that's different. This is a full-grown man. I looked at it, this is… he's not handling a satellite or a earth mover or something, it's just a knife. Well, I continued with my work, another two minutes later she says again, it's a very sharp knife, be careful. I said, come on, he's a full-grown man, leave him alone. 
He, he should know how to handle a knife by now. No, Sadhguru, it's a very sharp knife. <laughs> then I continue with my work and then she whispers so that I don't hear. Very sharp knife, be careful. <laughs> In two minutes he cuts his hand and I say, okay. Maybe he needed so much instruction <laughs> about this. This is all your problem is. You have a sharp intellect but not a steady enough hand. Now you're cutting yourself all the time. People come to me and say, Sadhguru, I can't bear with my boss, my mother-in-law, she's torturing me, my husband is impossible, my wife, oh. So I tell them, don't worry, you come here. Your boss, your mother-in-law, your husband, your wife, nobody will enter this ashram. Don't worry, I will give you a nice place to stay, good food to eat. Don't have to do anything, no work, nothing, just stay in your room. Whenever I come and check, you must be joyful. That's the only condition. If you're miserable, I don't believe in feeding misery. If you're joyful, for the rest of your life we'll bow down and take care of you. Oh, you leave them for twenty-four hours in one place, you must see the circus, okay? When you're alone, when you're alone, if you're miserable, obviously you're in bad company, isn't it? Isn't it? Somebody is with you and you're miserable, you can always say it's because of this person. You're alone and you're miserable means you're in bad company, you need to fix it. <laughs> you must understand this much, if you understand this much, then it's very simple, you would look inward. Looking inward is not contemplation, looking inward is not dissection because what you call as my body and what you call as my mind are accumulations that you picked up from outside. Your body is just the food that you've eaten, isn't it so? Hello? Your body is just a heap of food, isn't it? Not a pleasant way to describe you but it's a heap of food or it's a piece of this planet. Yes or no? Just a small piece of this planet that you picked up and walking around. If you don't understand this now, countless number of people who walked upon this planet before you and me, they were also smart people. Where are they? All topsoil, isn't it? This will also become topsoil. Unless your friends choose to bury you real deep, fearing that you may raise from the dead. That's why in India, we burn them and put their ashes in the ocean, in three different rivers, all over the land so that just in case if they try to come back, it never happened. <laughs> They're making sure this country is very wise in that way. <laughs> now, this is just a piece of planet that you picked up, isn't it so? You accumulated this. What you accumulate, can be yours, can never be you, isn't it so? Similarly, what you call as my mind, the whole content of your mind also is an accumulation of impressions. This is accumulation of food, this is accumulation of impressions. What you accumulate, you can claim that it is mine, but it can never ever be you. Do you understand this? Right now as I am speaking, I will pick up this vessel and say, this is my vessel. You will think, oh, Sadhguru's got some problem. But let's listen, because everybody says he's wise, let's listen some more. After some time I said, this is me, then you'll say, let's go. It's getting dangerous. If you are doing this every day, food appears on your plate, you say, this is my food, you eat it and then you say, this is me. The moment you think, that you are something that you are not, you have lost your fundamental perspective about life. After that, everything that you do is more and more insanity. If… if you believe that you are something that you are not, does it amount to insanity, I'm asking you? Even medically you qualify or no? Yes or no? Your only comfort is everybody is like that. That's how it is in an asylum. 
Everybody is like that only. Only the doctors looks insane, all right? Everybody is like in the same condition, everybody in the same condition will not make it right. So, the moment you have believed that you are something that you are not, what you gathered has become you, now you have no perspective of life, it is a complete confusion. Once there is no perspective, everything you, that you do is irrelevant. You will see this, you know this I'm with great distress I'm watching this happening all around me. The most successful people on the planet carry the most miserable faces on this planet. If you're a failure, once you come to terms with failure, you're okay, you know, at least you can take a walk on the beach. But successful people around the world carry miserable faces. This is a wrong message. If you send out a message that success is misery, the next generation may not seek success, which is very dangerous. Once a society does not seek success, that society is down the drain. You must understand this happened in a big way in United States of America, in sixties, the so-called successful people were so straight-jacketed and miserable nonsense, the younger people thought, we don't want to be like that. So they decided to smoke pot on the street side, at least we are happy, be peaceful. Once again America is going that way, big time, it's legal now. <laughs> India is going that way too, so parts of India is going that way. You need to understand if you… the next generation is hitting on alcohol and drugs, it's because of you. Because successful people are showing miserable faces, it's not worth pursuing success. But the sweetest thing in human life is success, isn't it? Yes or no? It doesn't matter whether it's a small thing that you're doing or a big thing that you're doing. You want those little act and the big act to be successful, yes or no? Whether you're building a nation or you're hitting a ball, you want it to be successful, isn't it? Because success is the sweetest thing. But now, if you send this… as a generation, if you send this message, success is misery, which is what is happening right now, because every successful person says he is stressed out, then why be successful if you can't enjoy it? Your only joy is you're better than somebody else, that's sickness. That is not… that is not joy. I am enjoying that I am little better than somebody, sickness. Now you are hungry, I have eaten well and I enjoy this. Is this not sickness? Yes or no? So right now this sickness is happening. If you really want to know the joy of existing here, you must understand the whole experience of life is generated from within you, never from outside of you. At least right now, even if you're not listening to me, can you see me? Hello? Those in the upper regions, can you see me? Use your hands and show where I am right now. Where am I? You got it wrong, you know I'm a mystic from South India. Some of you are seeing me there, not here. Whichever way, this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina, do you know the whole story? Yes? Where do you see me right now? Within yourself. Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself. Where have you seen the whole world? Within yourself. Everything that's ever happened to you, light and darkness has happened within you. Pain and pleasure has happened within you, joy and misery has happened within you, agony and ecstasy has happened within you. Anything that's ever happened to you has happened within you. You have never experienced anything outside of yourself because you're incapable of experiencing anything outside of yourself. You cannot experience what's happening here. Right now if somebody next to you touches your hand, you think you're experiencing their hand, no. You're only experiencing the sensations in your hand, you cannot experience their hand. Yes or no? In the very nature of things, everything that you ever experience 
happens from within you. The seat of your experience, the source of your experience is within you. At least what's happening from within you must happen the way you want it, isn't it? What's happening in the world may not happen the way you want it. At least what's happening from within you must happen the way you want it. Right now that is the problem, that what happens within you is not happening your way because of all the gadgets that you have seen, some of you are fascinated with your phones, you're not keeping it down, you're not looking at me, you're looking at the screen. All the gadgets that you have on the planet, is this human mechanism the most sophisticated gadget on the planet? What do the young people say? Hello? This human mechanism, is this the most sophisticated gadget on the planet? You're too engrossed in the iPhone and missing the eye. This is the gadget, isn't it? I'm asking you, have you read the user's manual? Have you read the user's manual? Just bumming around with life, somehow it works. Once in a way, I know when I got married I was so happy. Don't tell me about that day, tell me about the next twenty-five years <laughs> See, somehow anything can happen. By chance, by sheer chance anything can happen. On a certain day, a bull and a pheasant were upon a field. The bull was grazing upon the grass on the field. The pheasant was picking ticks off the bull, partnership. You believe in partnerships. There was a huge tree at the edge of the field. The pheasant, the bird, very nostalgically looked up at the tree and said, Oh, alas, there was a time I could fly to the topmost branch of the tree. Now I do not have enough strength in my wing even to get to the first branch of the tree. The bull very nonchalantly said, that's no issue. Eat a little bit of my dung every day. Within a fortnight, you will get to the topmost branch of the tree. The pheasant said, come on, what kind of rubbish is that? The bull said, really, try and see the whole humanity is on it. Very hesitantly, he started pecking at the dung and lo, on the very first day he reached the top, the first branch of the tree, Within a fortnight, he reached the topmost branch of the tree. Just sitting on the topmost branch of the tree, beginning to enjoy the scenery, the old farmer who was rocking on his rocking chair saw a fat old pheasant on top of a tree, pulled out his shotgun and shot the bird off the tree. The moral of the story is, many times even bullshit can get you to the top, but it never lets you stay there. If you are suffering, all you will see, all you will seek is the sweetness of pleasure and happiness, nothing more. Because people went on talking about or lived their life and made their lives an absolute suffering, that is why this whole idea of heaven, heaven is when you're unable to hear what somebody else is saying, your relationships will go bad. <laughs> In many ways, uh, the fundamentals of your relationship is you're willing to listen to the other person, isn't it? <laughs>